Well, say hello to everybody else as well. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Oh, honestly. Can't get the staff. They'll accuse me of being controlling. <laughs> um, so we carry on this week with our study about tenets, the core beliefs of the Apostolic Church. Mm -hmm. And uh, this week? The divine inspiration and authority of the Holy Scriptures. Or in other words, the Bible. Very good. You can put it down now. I wouldn't want you to strain yourself, lifting something so heavy. <laughs> oh, you're so kind. Thank you. Um, yeah, the, the idea that the Bible isn't just a book full of words, but it's... It's a library. It's a collection of books. Well, more than that, it, it is a book of words that carry authority because they come directly from God. And we'll look at that this evening as we study more. So let's start with Second uh, Timothy. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So we might ask ourselves, what, what is scripture? Um, and, and scripture really, for want of a better word, it's, it's a phrase that's used for sacred writings. And when we talk about scripture as Christians, what we're talking about is the Bible. Um, other faith groups, they would have sacred writings that they call scriptures. But for Christians, scripture is the Bible. And as Carrie says, it's a library, it's 66 books. Oh, I've got that song in my head. Oh, don't sing 66 it. 66 Don't books. sing it. Um, and, and when we talk about, well, where did the Bible come from? We look at the authors of the Bible. I mean, it's a bit of a rogues gallery, really, isn't it? When you think about the authors of the Bible, the men whose lives are described, or the people who even wrote the words. I mean, if we're honest, they were murderers. Mm -hmm. They were moaners. They were boasters. They were priests, nobles, commoners, the educated and uneducated, popular and despised. So many different types of personalities mm. who all had a hand in contributing to the Bible as we know it. But it goes to demonstrate that God uses anybody. Well, this is where we come to this first thought that they were all inspired by God. Mm. They all echoed his words either in the way they live their lives and how the Bible describes their actions or in the words that they brought directly from him. Yeah. And it, it hasn't, hasn't appeared, well, put my teeth back in. It hasn't appeared over five minutes, has it? No, it's um, taken quite a long time for people writing these books over the years, but it hasn't changed. Over the years. Well, it's estimated that the Bible has been written from around 1200 BC through to about 195 yeah. BC, the Old Testament was written over many hundreds of years. And the New Testament, um, speaking firstly about the life mm. and the ministry of Jesus Christ, and then following on with an explanation of that life and ministry through the letters to the churches, that happened in just one century. So just in the first hundred years, much of that was complete mm. or, or, or all completed. And so two halves, the Old and New Testament, one written before Jesus um, over many hundreds of years and the second, the New Testament. And um, we go further though, don't we? I mean, when the writer to Hebrews begins his letter, he talks about this, doesn't he? Yeah, in Hebrews 1 verses 1 and 2, it says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. And so there you see this idea of, through the writer to Hebrews, this explanation of God was the one mm. who was speaking through his word, and that it was God's authority that was being exercised in that word. Uh, and it's important. I mean, if we look 
perhaps at um, Genesis 15, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision, or in Samuel, the word of the Lord came to Samuel, mm. a prophet. Um, and, and what about kings with Elijah? Yeah, the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Or in Isaiah, um, the word that Isaiah saw. Um, and then Micah. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. And so what we're saying is that this, this volume of work, the, these writings were heard, seen, dreamed, visions or dreams, witnessed and spoken audibly to men. Mm. And as a result, that work was gathered together into what we now recognize as scripture. And Peter, the apostle, he, he says this, Second Peter chapter 1, he said, when it comes to things like the prophetic voice of God and men bringing a prophetic revelation, prophecy never came by the will of men. But holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So even Peter's saying that, you know, this is a, a supernatural thing mm. that was happening, that men didn't write good ideas because they thought, wouldn't this be a good idea for religion? Or were inspired by um, some kind of um, manifesto for life. But rather, God spoke and men listened and replied. Yeah. Or um, And... and you know, Paul carries on in Corinthians saying things, something similar, doesn't yeah, he? Yeah, he says, These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. And then John um, writes at the very beginning of his good news message, the gospel, The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And what he's saying is Jesus was the living embodiment of God's yeah. word. And so when we read scripture, both from the Old Testament all the way through to the New, we get this glimpse. They call it the thin red line, mm. don't they? This, this idea that all through scripture, Old Testament and New, there is this continuing theme of God's Son who will come and rescue mankind from yeah. their brokenness um, and right the way through. When you think that there are 66 books, countless writers over many hundreds of years, if you've ever taken the trouble to read this book, you will realise that it cannot have been something that a man planned. There was no human architect could have written a piece mm. of work that is so consistent and so all the way through has this constant overriding theme and lots of sub-themes and they all speak of God's glory yeah. and God's goodness and his mercy and his love. Nobody could have planned that. Not over that period of time. The Bible would have either had to be written over a very short period of time so a group of editors could have planned mm. it or else it has to be that God really did speak and over hundreds of years men wrote down an account of the things that God was saying to them. And that's why we believe that it's divine. It's not just oh, a clever idea that some people gathered works over, over history, because if they gathered works, there'd be lots of conflicts, wouldn't there? I never would. But the truth is, the Bible is so fluid, consistent, all the way through that as you follow from the beginning to the end and read it back again, it just makes more and more sense. You see how the story just connects together in an almost marvelous and remarkable mm. way but of course it's not marvelous and remarkable it's a holy spirit inspired yeah. thing so it's it's a god way a divine way and that's why we believe in the inspiration divine inspiration of scripture just looking at the bible for a minute um some facts about the whole idea of the continuity and the clarity so your bible that you have on your phone or your bible you have as a book um that came about in about AD 170. And it's something that the early church called a canon. So we said it's 66 books. This, this Bible has 66 books in it. And those books were canonized. They were put together. And if you like, that comes from the Greek word for rod or rule. In other words, the benchmark or the standard. So the early church said, this is the standard. Mm. This is what we accept as being from God and anything else we won't include, no matter how good it is. And there are lots of extra biblical material that's been written 
in a the ancient world, um, certainly there are some really good writings out there um, that didn't make it in, but they're still very good godly works. But the standard that they set for what they would accept as scripture in their canon was so high that even Hebrews didn't, almost didn't make it. Mm. And so about AD 170, most churches were in agreement. And by AD 303, there was this final agreement. Everybody agreed, yeah, okay, this is the standard Bible. We all agreed these are the books that are Christian books. And even then, the Roman Catholic Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, and the nonconformist churches vary slightly in what they've got because there are certain sections. One is called the Apocrypha, um, and they're including in some mm. denominational Bibles, but not in others. Yeah, and some, non have, some have like Maccabees in. Yeah, um, well, that, that would be part of the Apocrypha. Mm. Uh, but but the, the truth is that for nonconformists, for what we call Protestant, Pentecostal, Baptist, Evangelicals, that sort of thing, we all stand on this um, Bible as we know it today as the canon, um, and it doesn't include some of these other books, but that is the standard we accept. And of course, that came about with the work of King James, who wanted a Bible for ordinary people to be able to read in their language. And so what they did is they had it translated into the common English language. And of course, that's been both a blessing and a problem for years, hasn't it? Yeah, people um, were burnt at the stake for wanting to have Bibles in English. Yeah. People sacrificed a lot to have a Bible in a language that we can understand and have a relationship with God through. So before it was written in English, the church basically said, the church as it was at the time, basically said the only language the Bible can be in is Latin, mm -hmm. uh, the language of Rome. And so there was a rule that the presiding leadership of the church at the time didn't want the language in the, the Bible in the language of ordinary people. But of course, in the 1600s, King James came along and he said, let's have it in a common English, in the tongue of the common people. Because back then, prithee thou knowest, <laughs> when James the first was yon glorious king of thus set to the isle. We don't talk like that anymore, do we? Sounds like nonsense. But back then, people spoke like Shakespeare, didn't they? Mm. The, thou and this. I mean, we if you go to Yorkshire, Yorkshire, yeah, if you go yeah. to Yorkshire, they, they, you know, Yorkshire hasn't caught up with the rest of the country yet. They're still using than ours. <laughs> <laughs> We're just teasing for all our friends in Yorkshire. But... Many churches over the centuries since then, the, the next sort of 400 years, have held on to this authorised version as almost being, you know, like, the unchangeable, sacrosanct, sacrosanct yeah. never to be touched version of the Bible. But when James had it written, it was almost sacrilege for some people, the idea that it was written in ordinary plain English mm. of the common man. And, and so we see that happening again as modern translations. Late 20th century, my goodness me, people were really divided. Um, e even the Westminster Confession was very divided over whether we should just stick with the AV, the King James Version, or whether it was okay to have modern English so you could read the Bible like you talk to people normally. Mm. Um, and I'm glad to say that Modern translators have brought about a number of very good modern translations yeah. that have helped. Because at the end of the day, when King James was authorising his version, he had them translate it in a particular way because he didn't like certain terminology. Yeah. Um, so he didn't like the term slave and would often translate it as a bond servant instead because that was a bit more appealing. And how could the king representing the church and so on and God's ruler be over the earth yeah, yeah. be a slave? And so... Things were altered. so. It's... And they used the word charity back then. Mm. Whereas today we know that the word actually in modern English is love. And love and charity today are very different meanings. Yeah. So language has changed and we need a modern Bible in order to be able to make sense of what God is saying. Otherwise, we end up being dependent on an academic elect who can translate the mm. old language into our modern understanding. And that's not the heart of 
non-conformism, is it? No, it's not the heart of God either. That's a bit churchy, that, isn't it, actually? God wrote us this massive 66-book love letter Absolutely. for each one of us to be able to read and understand and study and fall in love with. And, and it's only in English where we have this peculiar problem. And Welsh, a little bit. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, well, I mean, in English, we've had this challenge that the Bible was translated into common English in the 1600s, and then many, many church folks wanted to hold on to that old language because it, it kind of had a familiar poetry to mm. it. And we understand why the, the prose and the, the, the verse has such um, a, a very kind of fond feel for a lot of people. We understand that. But when you go to Welsh, they have South Welsh, North Welsh and Chapel, and Chapel Welsh. Welsh. So there is a form of Welsh that is only really used in the chapel. And mm. you know, a lot of people say, I can't speak Chapel Welsh because it's mm. just so. Um, but mostly when you go around the world, people don't have that problem. The Bible's in German, they speak German. The Bible's in French, they speak French. The Bible's in Hungarian, Modjo, so, you know, Bizio Modjo. Um, and, and that's the way it is. Um, and what we realize is this idea that. If you think about it, around the world today, there are approximately 7,099, something like that, 7,000, mm. where did they get the 99 from? 7,099 languages. OCD, that's a bit annoying. You'd want to make another one up to make it 8,000. Well, th there has been research into this, and this, this has come from some of that research, that there's around 7,099 languages. They call them living languages. So that's languages that are still spoken yeah. by people in, in everyday life. And there are around 7,099 languages used around the world. Now, according to the Wycliffe um, Global Alliance, and that the people were very much embedded into the translation of the Bible into various languages, as of 2017, at least one portion of this Bible had been translated into 3,000, this is a lot, this, 3,312 mm. languages, almost Almost half of the languages of the world have some form of scripture available to them. And that's amazing, but it's also very challenging. It's very sad because half of them don't. Half of them don't, yeah. Mm. Um, I mean, but don't, don't think too badly of that because a lot of these living languages are actually indigenous languages and often with indigenous languages, there will be like a, a common national language. So if you go to Africa, there's lots of indigenous languages, but they may speak German, Belgian, English, mm. French. There'll be a, a national common language they speak. Um, and that's just how it is. But hey, it's great that that work's going on and more and more people are getting to know it. Do you reckon at least um, part of the New Testament or part of scripture has been translated? Um, let me think. The New Testament, is available in 1,521 languages, probably mm. more now because they're, they're doing new languages yeah, all yeah. the time. And then um, portions, so portions of that to another 1,121. That's a lot of people, mm. a lot of different languages. The complete Bible, right? 7,099 languages in all the world. The complete Bible has been translated as of 2017, so four years ago, into just... 670 languages. That's surprising, that, isn't it? Mm. You realise just how many people out there don't have God's word in their language. Well, I think that was the case with um, Christians meeting in my mum and dad's church, that it wasn't available in their native tongue. They were having to oh, the use La their second the, language. The Latvian yeah. tra travelling the Romani, yeah, yeah. The Romani, the Latvian Romani, yeah. Um, but it just goes to show how precious it is to have the Bible in our own language. Mm. And when you think about the fact that of all languages, there are more translations of the Bible available in English now than ever. Mm. How spoiled are we? That you don't just have a King James, but you have a new King James in modern language, but with the same kind of poetry mm -hmm. to, the, to the phrasing. You have the New American Standard Version, you have the contemporary English version. I'm just naming a few off the top of my head, but it just goes on. There's the and modern English version and the... Yeah, we have all these versions and how neglected is the Bible when it comes to reading. That's sad, isn't it? That half the world or more haven't got any scriptures 
in their language. Yeah. And yet we've got so many different versions and how few people really appreciate the treasure that they've been yeah. given. And then we, we go beyond that and just to finish this idea of um, languages, the, there are different types of expanded translations. We call them transliterated, which means rather than just saying the sentence, they add extra words in, not to change the meaning, but to help understand. Like the, the amplified. The amplified mm. or the message or the living translation. There's, so there's a number of translations out there that if you struggle reading the Bible or you struggle getting into the Bible, then there are translations out there that help you read it mm. in a way where it helps you to grasp what's being said. And we, we love the message Bible and some of the phrases they turn. That it just, it, It's just beautiful. The f unforced rhythms of grace is one of yeah. my favorites yeah. from Matthew. And I, I just love that. Um, and then today, let me get it out. Oh, it's in here somewhere. Today we are blessed with this thing called technology. And there it is, just for you to see. I recommend this to everybody that I'm mentoring or spending time with. Is a digital Bible app on your phone. So the Bible is always with me wherever I go. And what's beautiful about a Bible app is the fact that I, I can actually have whichever translation I prefer or compare yeah. them. Yeah. That with a lot of these apps, you get daily readings. So it helps you to make sure you're reading your Bible. It's not just sitting in the corner gathering dust. And also, um, there's just this very usable for a modern mm. generation, isn't it? Um, so the Bible apps, and we, we recommend, um, not because we get in any commission, well, it also means you're not struggling with trying to find a large print Bible because you can just make it bigger on your phone. Absolutely. And if you have struggled with eyesight, once you've got it all set up, you can press play and it will read it to you. Mm. Um, so, so for those reasons, we recommend version Bible. There are other good ones, but I've been using version for a long time, as have a number of, of folks around us. And we recommend that because having yeah. used it a lot, we found it's really, really helpful to be able to search the Bible. You, you want to find that word. So that's just a thought of your Bibles and, and the background to it all. But we want to look at this idea tonight. We're talking about the core belief of the church, not just, you know, <laughs> topic about um, Bible knowledge, mm. trivia. But actually, what's the Bible all about? about? And it's this, it's divine. And so it has authority. And this Bible has power to change lives. Not because it's a book with pages and words on it, but because of who brought those words, mm. God himself, that we read. Well, when, when you consider that God spoke creation into existence, how powerful is that word? Yeah. And, and so when we read, what we're reading is a living word mm. because it comes from a supernatural living God so it has this dynamic effect that when you read it, it has an effect on your life. Um, in fact, when we read Hebrews 4. Yeah, Hebrews 4 verse 12 says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's a fantastic mm. thought, isn't it? It's like surgery. Well, that's exactly what it is. The, the, the truth is that many a person has read the Bible and said, you know, when I let the Bible, when I get into the Bible, mm. I find the Bible is getting into me. That it is not like any other literary work. It's not like anything else. That the Bible really is living. And the more you read it and the more you read and study and think about, we call it meditation, but what we're talking about is prayerful thought and careful consideration of the meaning and the implication of what we're reading. It has a profound effect mm. on our lives. It's living, it's powerful, and it has authority. We see an account in the New Testament, a gospel uh, account of Jesus's life, and we're told Jesus was being tempted by the devil, that the devil had appeared to him and had tested him. And we are told at the end of that period of testing 
that the devil started to challenge Jesus. And in effect, he was saying, has God said? Mm. And, and, and the answer was, yes, God has said. But Jesus answered him with these simple words. It is written. Yeah. In other words, there is an authority in what God has spoken that's been written down that has implications both in heavenly realms, earthly realms, and even in those dark mm. realms beneath. That God's word is so powerful. There is nothing like it. So when people are practicing all their hocus pocus and their mumbo jumbo, it still has no power over God's word. Mm. That when Jesus says to the Lord of darkness, it is written, game over, argument ended. That is the authority. That is the final word of God to mm. men. And therefore, that's why we believe in the Bible having authority because we see even the ruler of this world himself is subject yeah. to the written word of God. That's powerful. Mm. That is powerful. And so we think about this idea that um, Paul writes to the Romans. He says, you know, we talk about this idea that we, we trust, we believe in the salvation of Jesus Christ through faith. It's a faith thing. We don't see it. We don't. We can't hold on to Jesus. We can't see the holes in his hands. We can't hear him speaking to us directly. We have to read it from his word. But Paul says that, you know, faith comes through that. Faith comes through hearing and hearing through the word of God. In other words, there's something about this word that opens our hearts up to start to see mm. what can't be seen with the naked eye. But suddenly we can see it with the faith and the heart, the reality of what God's done for us. It's right there through the word. Um, and then in Thessalonians, there's that explanation, isn't there? For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. And I think sometimes the church has got so, and I'm talking about the church wide, I'm not talking about the Christian centre, I'm not talking about the apostolic denomination, I'm talking about the church in mm. general, has got so stuck on form and formality, go, got so stuck on theological high notes of debate that we don't see the power of the word be in evidence so mm. much these days. And we still see it at times. Um, God's word is powerful. I, I've seen people open God's word and speak from God's word and, and people have got saved. And mm -hmm. it's not like someone was being clever and opening the Bible saying, right, I'm going to tell you about salvation and tell you why you need it. They were just talking about something about the living, breathing God from scripture. Yeah. And it had an impact on people's lives. This word's powerful. Over the years, we, we can talk about in, in our movement, certainly over the years, the number of men and women who have heard God's word and it has cut them right, yeah. cut to the quick is the old phrase, mm. cut them right to the depth of their heart. Their feelings were really touched because what they heard registered deep within them. Yeah. It's living, it's powerful, it has an effect. When this word is spoken, it has impact. And I think sometimes as believers, we get into this dangerous place where we forget just how much power this word contains. Yeah. And we start to think it's all about how I deploy the word or how I explain the word, mm. but it's not. This word is powerful. It's the power of God for salvation. Not the evangelist, not the clever sermon, not the, you know, the, the clever thinking we should do it this way because we'll win more people. It's this that is the power of God, the word. And so we believe in the divine authority mm. and inspiration of scripture, that it's God brought, inspired. Yeah. God breathed is the old way of saying it. And it is carrying all the authority that God chose to impart into it. So it has this massive effect on our lives, doesn't it? Yeah, and rather than trying to make the Bible fit our lives, we should make our lives fit the Bible. That's a good point. Mm. And so when we look at this, this idea that um, the psalmist says, you know, your word has given me, listen to this for a phrase, Psalm 119, verse 50, your word has given me mm. life. This living word brings this new living life into us. It's, it's a powerful thing. 
And of course, the psalmist, when he's reflecting, he's not talking about salvation through Jesus Christ because that's something to come. But he's even in thinking about God's word, he's thinking about how God breathed breath into Adam. Mm. You might say God whispered life and life happened. <laughs> it's an interesting thought, isn't it? Um, and then one of our popular ones, we sing this as a song sometimes, we hear it quoted a lot, your word is a lamp yeah. to my feet. You want a guide book? You want a psychology manual? You want a counselling book on how to live life well, how to think well and how to mm -hmm. see life in a right way? God's word. Yeah. Powerful. Um, and, and then it goes further, doesn't it? Because we read in Psalm 107, he sent his word and healed them. Mm. There's healing in this word. If you read what God has to say about healing and you believe it, it'll happen. It's all about faith, faith in God's word. But not only that, he delivered them from their destructions. This word is a saving word. Yeah. And then um, we finish with this thought in Isaiah. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. When God spoke his word, he had every intention that his word would be effective and it would take effect in the way he intended for it to do. Mm. And the way he intended it to take effect was to be life-changing, mind-changing, soul-renewing. It is the revelation of God's love and God's plan for eternal life for humanity. Yeah. And in it are the answers to life, the universe and everything god's word we believe was divinely inspired and has all authority yeah it's the benchmark by which we measure everything else that is said and done in church yeah brilliant we could say so much more tonight but we're out of time it's been great to have you with us look forward to seeing you again with us soon but just remember we're praying for you we encourage you to get into this word and let this word get into you. Yeah. It is life changing. But right now we pray that God would watch over you, that he would bless you and keep you safe, that he would fill you full of his goodness, his mercy yeah. and his peace. We'll see you soon. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.